Good morning. Good to see everybody out. We appreciate you being out on our Tuesday morning truce. And uh, those that will be online and hopping online there in a little bit or directly, as we'd say. But we appreciate everybody that's out this morning. And uh, God bless you. Thank you for taking time to come out. We'll be on lesson number seven on discipleship. And I'm still talking about salvation. So those of you that are online, if you want to get your Bible, we're going to be in First John chapter number three this morning. Before we get started up, we've got a couple of things to talk about. Number one, birthdays. Today is Gwen Morgan's birthday. Birthday and happy birthday, Miss Gwen. I, I don't even know where they are. Undisclosed, Undisclosed location. <laughs> so that's exactly where they are. <laughs> so uh, they're in an undisclosed location. But happy birthday. Happy birthday, Miss Gwen. And then Barb's is the 10th. And then Broden, our grandson, his is the 12th. And then Roxanne's mom's 96th birthday is on the 11th. So, wow. So, wow. May God bless all those folks. Anniversaries coming up. <laughs> Todd and Lorena's are coming up on the 10th. And uh, happy anniversary to you all. We're going to get ready to go to prayer real fast here and get started up. Don't forget, now, Sebby's coming to town. And, uh, man, I invite people to be here Sunday morning, Sunday night. Plan on being out both times. I'm going to tell you what, man. You, If you've never met or heard Sebby, you'll love Sebby. You'll just, you'll just absolutely fall in love with Sebby. And he's coming. He'll be here Thursday now. So pray for them to have a good, safe trip down. But also pray on Thursday we're going to meet with the city about our building and send what we're moving forward with the permit. So pray that uh, that works out and, and that'll be a, a, a smooth thing to get started up. And then thank thank everybody for the building fund. The building fund, people are giving offerings. People are giving. Thank God, people online are giving. People in the church are giving. And wow, what a blessing that was. That is, and I appreciate all of you that are doing your part. And uh, you know, everybody does a little bit, makes it a lot easier. But thank everybody for for giving. We're certainly blessed. Certainly blessed. So uh, don't forget to pray at three twenty every day. I hope you're still praying at three twenty. And uh, Ephesians 3.20, now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So uh, we want to continue to pray for our church, Amen. see souls saved, and man, what God is doing, and new people coming, new people being added in and, and uh, being baptized. Wow, what a blessing. So try to invite folks out for this weekend for sure for Sebby being here. And I know it's summertime. Uh, in Florida, that doesn't mean anything, does it? I, I mean, you know, up north, it's once once uh, Memorial Day hits, man, I mean, it's just like, wow, just shoo, everybody's gone. But in Florida, that really doesn't affect us too much. And uh, we're just excited about getting everybody back, and then our snowbirds will be coming back in. They're going to be shocked, a lot of those snowbirds coming back in. They'll be looking around and saying, wow, who are all these folks? And what a blessing that will be. But uh, we certainly thank God for that. Took in the three new members Sunday. Miss Glenna was one of them. And Steve and Vivian. Boy, I tell you what, uh, three great folks that we were privileged to take in on Sunday. And uh, just thank God for that. Pray for our country. We are just talking a little bit a minute ago before we got online about how bad the country is. And, of course, you know what this month is and, and Pride Month and Disney and all that stuff, and I'll be saying more about that tomorrow night, but it's a mess, and, and we just need to pray for our country. Pray for Nina. Nina is in Nebraska. Uh, our Ukraine girl is over here. I talked to Donnie Bannister the other day. Donnie is is is, is a guy that really got us hooked up because he, he goes to Ukraine and ministers and got us hooked up with Nina, and Nina is over here because her brother, Sasha, has MS. And it's bad off. And Donnie said he can't even read. I don't. I didn't know that MS could attack your eyes, but I guess it's attacked his eyes. And they, they brought him over here to try to get him better treatment. And I'm not sure that it's helping any. So I don't know what Nina is going to be doing. But uh, she's here for a while. Uh, Donnie said she hadn't. It didn't. She only bought a one-way ticket. So he thinks she came to try to help her family out. But boy, I tell you what. That, that, that little girl's got a servant heart, buddy. I, she's about 30 years old and just every day giving her life to help uh, the people in Ukraine at the Inspiration Center. And uh, if you haven't picked her up on Facebook, you ought to pick her up. And it's Nina Missionary, N-I-N-A Missionary. 
And you might you might have to send her a message or something. She's got to be real cautious about who she picks up because of the war with Russia and all the all this stuff that's going on over there. But you know, if you mention us or our church or something, maybe that'd help you. But uh, wow, what a great young person she is. But we want to pray for them again. Pray for Sebby and Stacy as they'll be traveling. Uh, is, uh, did they leave today or leaving tomorrow? Now, since he backed up a day, do you know? I don't know. But uh, anyhow, they'll be here Thursday. Or they'll be in Florida probably Wednesday. Uh, Stacy's mom lives in Gainesville, and uh, they'll be up there. So then he'll be here Thursday, and continue to pray for Becky, his daughter and granddaughter Amelia. Evelyn sent word she's not here this morning. Got some stuff going on, and. Uh, uh, Jamie Lynn has pneumonia, so I want to pray for Jamie Lynn. I, I, I'm sure that's probably difficult on her with her condition and everything, so pray for Jamie Lynn. Pray for Leanne Brown and all her family still been sick. At, uh, hopefully they're getting over it. Connie McCartney still has to have that pr procedure for blood clots. Bella Hall, little two-year-old, has got to have surgery to see if they can help her to talk. Kim Thompson, boy, it's great to see Kim out Sunday morning. And uh, she seems to be in a lot of pain. And she'll be having surgery on the 11th. So continue to pray for, for uh, Kim. Uh, Richard Helfenstein has a spot on his lung. And he's had cancer before and has cancer. So pray for Richard. Uh, Josh Hernandez, that's, that's Janae's son, who's going to be having surgery on the 19th of this month. Uh, he's the other electrician. He comes and generally sets over in this area right here. Uh, Jim and Dixie Long. Jim's got to have a heart cath second week of June. I guess that would be next week. And also their son Jason and Braxton Mahone is a newborn baby that had to have major surgeries, and they're not giving them much hope on that. So pray for them. Charles Cleghorn uh, is Darlene Stokes' his uncle. Do you, you, is he from around here? Do you know So he had a heart valve surgery yesterday and doing well, may get to come home today. So pray pray for them. And then her aunt, Patty Burdick, has got aggressive leukemia and in the hospital. And then Darlene's got some health issues she's dealing with too. And she just retired, so bless her heart. Uh, Colt Peterman, our young boy, that's got, got to have a PET scan, MRI in three weeks. And uh, we've got a lot of folks. Rachel, uh, is that Hendon, Hendon Bill? And that's Bill's sister who is waiting on results of a PET scan. And then Marilyn Robertson is Barbara and Shirley's sister. has got lung cancer. And then her brother Mike is going through chemo treatments. And Cliff and Shirley not here today. Cliff had a bad night. So God bless them. But we appreciate everybody uh, that's out. Everybody's online today. And uh, our first lady got the prayer list out this morning. As I say, it, try to say about every Tuesday, if your name wasn't on it, you need to just praise the Lord, man. Just, just say thank you, Jesus. But we had lots of people on there and lots of people with a lot of needs. So uh, pray for them. I hope that you'll look at it. I hope you'll check it out. Pray for them as you think about it down through the week. You know, and, and if you can't call them out, you, at, least, at least as you pray and ask God to bless all those on the prayer list. Because, you know, God knows who they are. Amen. Amen. And uh, just ask God to bless those on the prayer list. So pray for Janae. Uh, she's still with her mom. Her stepdad is uh, still not doing well, and they're looking for a rehab facility to try to get him in. But she's been down there. And where, where is that? Where is down there? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I think I thought it was over. Uh, Lauderdale, Miami area? No. no, no, no. Sebring? Sebring, yeah. Se Se but, but Okay, well, yeah, that will be on the Seaburn area. So pray for Janae and them, but pray for all of our people, and let's pray that God will continue to bless us, continue to be the church that God wants us to be and be loving and kind and welcoming and, and do all we can. But we still have to, you know, you can be welcoming and kind and loving, but you don't have to condone everything that's going on in the world. Right. All right, yeah, that's not really, you know, they've got the message backwards. They They think if you disagree with them, you hate them. No, we don't hate them. We love them. Right. They need the truth, but they're shutting the truth down. And then they don't want anybody to speak the truth. We don't hate them. We love them. And man, listen, they need the Lord, and they need to hear Amen. what the Bible says, Bible truth. So let's pray that we can be a church. i got a feeling it's going to get worse as time goes on. 
I don't think it's going to get any better, and uh, we just need to continue to pray. Amen? So let's Amen. pray this morning. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be out on Tuesday morning truce. Thank you for these people that have taken time out here on a summer morning to come out a beautiful day and be with us, and those people have taken time to be online. We appreciate all of our people, and Lord, the way they're sacrificing, the way they're giving, the way they're loving, and Lord, inviting people out. Lord, we just pray you continue to help us to see a great movement in our church and lord we pray for all these names and situations that we've talked about this morning lord that you'll be with them and and help each one lord we pray all those on our prayer list and lord i pray for uh, the meeting we've got thursday with the, the the city about building on lord i pray that that will go well and you'll intervene in that and take care of that help us with that Lord, we just thank you for all that you're doing. And Lord, we just pray today that you'll help us to have a, a good lesson as we study your word, talk about salvation again. And Lord, we give you the praise and the thanks for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So kind of a pre prelude to tomorrow night. If you, if you can, you ought to be out to be online tomorrow night. Uh, I'll be on, on cultural Marxism, part number two. And, you know, I just got to say again, really... Really, you know, as I was studying and working on it yesterday, it's just almost sickening. I mean, it's heartbreaking what's happening in our country. And uh, hardly nobody, you really can't hardly even speak speak against it because if you do, they mark you, they they, they label you. And, and we just need to continue to pray that uh, God would help us. And again, it may be all part of the plan of God. We, we may be coming right down to the end. Uh, America's got to sink, you know, as as we get to the end of the church age and the rapture of the church and then the tribulation period. So, I mean, we're in a mess. And uh, But you know what? It's a good time to be a light for Jesus. Amen. The darker it is, the more our little light can shine. This little Amen. light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, I don't want to get into singing mode today. But anyhow, <laughs> lesson number seven on discipleship. We'll be talking about salvation again. Our seventh lesson on salvation. As I keep saying, if there's one thing we need to get right, it's the doctrine of salvation. So many people, obviously, I think I can say this, obviously, obviously, unsaved people don't know anything about salvation. They right. don't know what it takes to be saved. Churches and denominations got all kind of different ideas about what it takes to be saved, and, and Christians don't really know what it takes to be saved. We need, we need to get the Bible plan of salvation. You know, we've got all kind of tracts. We've got all kind of literature that tells you very simply how to be saved. And we need to stay with, stay with the course and stay with that. Amen? Amen. But uh, we've got to get it right. We've got to get it right. Question to start out this morning, not a question for you to answer, but a question for you to think about, is what is salvation? And we've been talking, this is our seventh lesson on salvation. And, and what is salvation? What does it mean to be saved? To be religious is not the same as being saved. Right. You know, you can be religious and not have a relationship with the Lord. There are a lot of people that are religious. They go to church and they, they give their money and they, they, they go through all the, all the rituals and the rites and the rules and the regulations, but they've never opened their heart up to the Lord and been saved. Saved or salvation, the word saved or salvation really means to deliver. That you've been, if you've been saved, you've been delivered from sin to salvation. You've been, been delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. You've been delivered from the household of Satan, the family of Satan, to the family of God. Wow. Amen. The, the Hebrew and the Greek words talk about, imply, when you, when you read salvation, you go back and look at the words in Hebrew and Greek, it talks about deliverance, it talks about safety, it talks about uh, preservation talks about healing, talks about soundness. And that's what salvation is. Well, salvation is that we've been saved from the penalty of sin. Amen. That's what salvation is. You know, you ask, you ask some people about being saved. They don't have uh, saved from what? what? What I need to be saved from? What, what, what's out there to get me? They don't realize that there's a penalty for sin. So, you know, when we talk about saved, that includes words like justification, sanctification, glorification, redemption, propitiation, grace, forgiveness, 
imputation. Well, that'd be a good lesson on all those words in and an I O N. But uh, you know, that's the word "save" takes in all that. It's no wonder the writer said in Hebrews two three, "How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation?" Salvation is great. I mean, it is absolutely amazing. Amen? Amen. And we've been saved. Salvation is being saved from sin and the penalty of eternal death and damnation. But it's also being saved to everlasting life. Amen. It's, but man, that's, salvation is the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. Amen. To think about being in, in heaven forever and ever and ever. Notice, I'm going to say something to you. I want you, I want you to understand this and, and get this word today. It's salvation, not probation. I think some people think it, you get saved and you get put on probation. You know what probation is. You get in trouble and they let you out or they, they let you go to see how you're going to do. Check out, see if you're going to walk the, walk the straight line without getting any trouble. Well, that's not salvation. Salvation, I'm going to say again today, seven weeks in a row, I'm going to say again today, salvation is eternal. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about salvation being a probationary period to see if you can really make it. You know, sometimes we use the talk, we say, well, if I can just hold on. Well, really, we can't hold on. Jesus holds on to us. And... You know, it's not, it, I'm so glad that when you got saved, that you got saved and you didn't get put on probation. If we'd, if we'd have gotten put on probation, I'd already been put back in jail. I, I mean, I mean, honestly, you know, we're not on probation, we're on salvation. Remember those 13 verses that we talked about, that all, every one of those verses I gave you several weeks ago, we talked about everlasting life or eternal life. It's everlasting, it's eternal. I don't. I really don't know how much plainer to make that that people look at. So, well, you know, it's 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 all these conditions. No salvation is believing in the Lord Jesus, being born again, and being saved for eternity. It's not about works. It's about grace. Works ought to be a part of, of your life after you get saved. Amen. That's we ought to work for Jesus. We ought to want to do more for Jesus. Somebody saves you and pulls you out of, the, out of the middle of the road, keeps you from getting run over, you ought to be indebted to them. Right. Jesus saved us from hell. We ought to be, we ought to feel an indebtedness to, to that. Amen. We ought to want to serve Him. We ought to want to work for Him. We ought to want to give to His cause and be a part of what He's doing. So there's a great verse, and, and I, I don't think I've used it in these seven lessons, but I'm going to use it today. And it's found in Romans 11, 6. This would be a good verse for you to, you, you to look at. And listen to what it says. Romans eleven six says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. What Paul was saying is that it, 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 if it's by grace, it can't be by grace and works. Because if you put works in it, it's no more grace. So listen to what he said. He said, And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if be of work, be of works, then is it is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. So he's, he's, he's giving you a clear different, differentiation. I'll use that word, educational word, to show you there's, there's a difference. It can't be grace and works mixed together. When you mix grace and works together, it's no more grace. And you can't be saved by works. If you could, Jesus died in vain. So it's got to be all of grace. And again, let's get it right about salvation because people's eternal destiny and their soul are counting on it. Amen? Amen. And, uh, you know, you, if you tell someone they can make a profession of faith, and here's, the, here's where we're going to today. If you tell somebody they, uh, you just make a profession of faith and then you've got a license to go out and live like you've been living, you don't have to change anything, just continue on in just blatant sin, that's false teaching. That's false teaching. But it's also false teaching if you tell somebody you're saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. Every time you sin, sin you're lost. you got to get saved again. That's false teaching also. Amen? So Amen. why don't we just teach what the Bible says? So today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3. I love this chapter. I love this chapter. And uh, I've had a lot of fun with these verses down through the years. 
One time I took my Bible into a deacon's meeting and I laid it out, kind of threw it out on the table and said, here guys, read 1 John chapter 3 and explain these verses to me. Well, nobody could explain them. I'd go to Christians and say, hey, uh, explain these verses to me. Read these and explain. They'd look and go, wow. Man, I can't explain it. Preachers would say, I can't explain that. Well, that's why we need to study. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And, and, and when we look at the, I can remember uh, a church we were in several years ago, and, and they were letting me teach a class, and, and we were teaching on salvation, and I got on this, and I had a lot of older people in that class, and they loved the old-time way, and, and we just had a good time in that class. And I was teaching on this, these verses, and we got down into, into the middle of this. One of, one of them hollered and said, help me, help me, hurry, get me through this. Well, well, I'm confused. And I said, just hang on, I'll help you out. But before we read those verses, you know, I think about, I think about a time I had a preacher that was in our church, and he got up and preached on this passage of Scripture and preached it wrong, deadly wrong, dangerously wrong. And I was a young pastor, and uh, man, I had to call his hand on. I told him, I said, listen, he didn't like it. I said, listen, I can't tell you what to preach, but I can tell you when to preach, and you won't be preaching here. And you can imagine how that went over. That went over like a like a lead bloom. But he 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 preached this these verses by just reading them out and preaching them out without any thought of what it means and what it says and how to interpret those verses. So I want to look at those today. But before we do, before we do, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I want you to participate. How many people in here have been saved? Raise your hand big and high. All right, I think everybody's good. checking you out. I think everybody's been saved. How many people have sinned since you've been saved? Up, up, up. Everybody's got their hand up. So we're saying, on one hand, we're saying we're, we've all been saved. But on the other hand, we're saying we've all sinned since we've been saved. Now, let me read these verses to you and just read them. And I'm going to go back and explain them. Don't panic. Don't have a heart attack on me. I'm going to just start with verse number 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called... The sons of God. Wow, what a blessing it is to be called a son of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Boy, there's a lot of preaching and teaching in that. We don't have to wait till we die, or wait till we get old, or wait till we get to heaven. The Bible says, Behold, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, talking about Jesus, when he comes back, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse number three is an important verse. And every man that hath this hope in him, in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. There's another verse that teaches if, if you've been saved by grace and been saved by, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you, you want to live godly and holy. You don't want to live an impure, unholy uh, uh, life. People that want to do that have never, ever truly been saved. Now, it's going to get down into some stuff. Watch out. Watch out. Hang on. Verse number four. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. It's breaking the law of God. We, we good with that? Verse number five. And ye know that he, talking about Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Can we agree with that? Yeah. Jesus came and died for sin, and there's no sin in him. Right. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Now, verse number six, where we're going, it's really going to get good. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not whosoever abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him 
Now, wait a minute. Let me just stop, take you back just a minute. You raise your hand. You said, I'm, I've been saved. Then you raise your hand and said, but I've sinned since I've been saved. If you read this verse and don't understand what this verse is saying and you don't, don't, don't study this out and you read verse number six, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Well, you can imagine how I felt when a guy got up preached in, in, in a church I was pastoring that if you'd have, had ever sinned, you, you'd never been saved. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that's what that's saying? That's what it appears to be saying. That's what it appears. But if you study it out and understand what the Bible teaches, what the Bible is saying here, that's not what it's saying. If you, if you just read it out, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now listen, there's nobody that's sinless. There ain't nobody ever lived it that's been sinless but Jesus Christ. We sin by acts of commission, things that we commit, and omission, things that we fail to do. The Bible says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Verse number 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Wow. If you're reading through the Bible and you read that verse, that calls you just about to lose your mind. Because you say, well, man, I've been saved. But I've also sinned since I've been saved. How do you reconcile that? We're going to reconcile it here just in a minute. Hang on. Verse number seven, little children. Talking, that's talking to the Christian people. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth, listen to this, he that committeth sin is of the devil. Did you just say you sinned? That verse said, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. You just said you sinned. You just said you're a Christian. You just raised your hand and said, I've been saved. You raised your hand and you said, but I've sinned. Verse number 9 says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Can you understand? Let me just ask you before we talk about that. Don't panic on me. Don't, get, don't, don't have an anxiety attack. Can you understand if you just read that without having a, 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 an understanding or explanation how that could cause you to go, wow, well, maybe I'm not even saved. Maybe I didn't really get saved. That's not what the, these verses are talking about. You want me to help you with it? You want me to just leave you there hanging? I can leave you hanging and, and let you go home and, and wonder about it for two or three days and drive yourself crazy, or I can help you with it. Let's go back to verse number 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. Now, I'm going to help you with something right here. Listen to me. Look at me. You see that word sinneth? In our King James Bible, when you see a word with E-T-H on it, it means continually. You with me? Let's make it real simple. This verse is not saying whosoever commits a sin is not saved, but whoso habitually and continually commits sin, has never been saved. No change, no conversion. Again, people say, well, you know, I got saved and nothing happened. I didn't have, nothing happened to me. I didn't have a different desire. I didn't have a different direction. I didn't have, I didn't fall in love with Jesus. I didn't begin to love the things, the spiritual things. And I'm still going out. I'm, I'm still going out. I'm drinking every day. I'm running to bars and clubs. I'm cheating on my husband, cheating on my wife. I'm, I'm out here doing all this stuff. Guess what? You ain't never been saved. This verse says, look, look at it again. 
Whosoever abideth, abideth, continue in him, sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him, you, you listen, you do not live in continual sin. Right. You do not live in habitual sin. I'm not, and we're not, I'm not, I'm, and I'm talking about a lifestyle of sin. You know, there's difference in a sin and a lifestyle of sin. The alphabet people and the people today, they come and say, well, there's no difference. We, we all sin. Well, they, yeah, that's true. But we're not living in a lifestyle of sin. We're not living in a permanent place of sin. And there are people that are living in a permanent place of sin who's living in a, in a habitual lifestyle. And there are people that are telling you, well, you know, I've been saved. I can, I can cuss and I can do it. Let me say again, if you've truly been saved, you don't want to cuss. You might cuss. You might sin. You might do something wrong. You might look at the wrong thing. You might see the wrong thing. You might lose your temper. You might get angry. But you don't want to do it. Right. If you're truly saved, you don't want to do those things. Amen. So verse number 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. That that's means they're not continual in a, in a habitual state of sin. Whosoever sinneth, that's not whosoever sins. That's why you got to know what the ETH means. It's not saying whosoever commits a sin hath not seen him. It's saying whosoever habitually sins. Whosoever habitually lives in a state of sin hath not seen him, neither known him. Does that help you right there? Yeah. Everybody good with that? Yeah. That help? That, that, that make more sense? Number one, let's just let's break it down real easy. Number one, it's, it doesn't make biblical sense if we read it without understanding it. That's right. Because we've all we've all been saved, but we've all sinned. So there has to be some reconciliation. Something there's got to be something that we're missing in that verse. Because if it is, if that be the case, none of us are going to make it. But yet the Bible teaches over and over that we've been saved, that we've been eternally saved, that we have everlasting life. So you've got to realize then it's got to be saying something. And the, and the King James translators, when they, when they translate it out of the, out of the original Greek, they put, the, they, 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 they put words in there that just like the ye's and the these and the, the, the words with E-T-H means continually. To continue to do that. Again, let's go back to what I said Maybe on week one of this lesson. I said it a minute ago. There are people that teach you can get saved or say you got saved and continue to live exactly like you lived before you got saved. Well, this verse says that's not true. This verse says you can't live like that because if you did, you ain't never been saved. Or there's the group of people that, that I came out of that taught where you got saved and every time you sin, you're lost. You save, you're lost. You save, you're lost. Well, that, that's not true either. This verse and these past, this passage of Scripture is telling us that they've never been saved. Right. It's not that they've been saved and they've, they've backslidden and they've lost their salvation. They need to get saved again. If you're living like that, you ain't never been saved. That's, right. that's, why, that's why my preaching is a mystery to a lot of people. I preach so hard on sin and so hard on living right that people think I'm preaching that if you sin, you lost your salvation. I don't preach that at all. I preach what I preach, preach what the Bible says. Amen. If you've been saved, then you ought to be you ought to be coming out of sin. You ought to be, your lifestyle ought to be cleaning up. You ought to be purifying yourself. You ought to be continually beginning to be, become more holy and more godly and more like Christ, not more like the devil. We're, we're, listen, we're, so the Bible just up there said we're the sons of God. Should we take on the characteristics of our father? Yes. I mean, you know, you know, ask my wife. My dad's dead and gone, but my dad will never die as long as I'm alive. And sometimes I open my mouth up and I say, I say boy, I sound just like my daddy. <laughs> and sometimes I'm stubborn, just like my daddy. 
And sometimes I'm bullheaded, just like my daddy. And sometimes I fly off the handle, just like my daddy. You know why? I'm, I'm because he's my daddy. Uh, he's in me. I'm, in, you know, I've got his, I've got his blood. I've got his, his characteristics in, in me. When we get saved and become a child of God, shouldn't we manifest some of those characteristics? the heavenly father I'm going to say it again to you it's false doctrine to tell somebody you can make a profession of faith and go right out that door and you don't ever have to come back you don't ever have to change you can continue to do what you want continue to live in sin continue to have a lifestyle of sin and you're okay that's not what the bible teaches these verses teach it correctly Read it again to you. Verse number six. You, you, you good? Everybody good? Everybody still saved? Okay, just make sure. Whosoever <clears throat> abideth in him sinneth not. Not continually habitual lifestyle of sin. Whosoever sinneth, whosoever sinneth habitually, continually, hath not, <clears throat> hath not seen him Neither known him. I think you can take that verse right there and explain that verse. By the way, if you want to have fun with people, use these verses I'm using and go up to them and ask them to explain it. Read this and explain it to me. And you're talking about, you're talking about people just to, their, their jaw dropping open. Because they, 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 they don't, if, if they haven't been taught, they don't understand that. Verse number seven, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth, what's, what's do got on it? E-T-H. What's that mean? Continually, he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. That's a continual doing of the right thing. Look at verse number 8. He that committeth sin. What's commit got on it? ETH. What's ETH mean? Continually. It's not saying he that commits a sin, he that commits, if it said he that commits a sin is of the devil, we'd be in trouble. Because you all raised your hands and said, well, I've sinned since I've been saved. Well, are you of the devil? No, you're a child of God. The, those verses above that just said you're a child of God. But it does say if you understand, he that committeth sin, he that commits continually a habitual lifestyle of sin is of the devil. They ain't never been saved. They've never been saved. They've never known the Lord. I'm going to say again, if something as big and powerful and great as Almighty God comes into your heart and you haven't had some kind of change, boy, you're in trouble. That's right. You just walked down the aisle, shook hands with the preacher. You just got in the water hole and got wet. You ain't never got saved. Because I'm going to tell you what, when God comes in and the Holy Ghost comes in to live in your heart, he starts kicking up all that stuff. And he'll, hey, he'll dig, it'll be like spring cleaning going on. He'll dig around and stuff that you, you've forgotten about. He'll dig and get it because he's trying to get it out of your life so that you can begin to purify yourself to live the way God wants you to live. Amen. We got people all over America that teach us, oh, just get saved. That's why, that's why there's such a, a division between this side of, of save, lost, save, lost, save, lost, and this side said live any way you want, live any way you want, you're okay. Those are, those are irreconcilable. You can't reconcile those two. But what you can do is take the Bible and say, well, you're both wrong. And boy, nobody wants to hear that. You ever try to tell somebody you're wrong? Imagine me telling that preacher who was older than I was that, you listen, you ain't going to preach that here. <laughs> yeah, ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. You're not going to get up and tell people. You're not going to get up and preach to people that if you committed a sin, you're lost. Can you imagine how that went over? I'm sitting there going, wow. I said, man, you, 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 man that ain't going to happen. But yet there's people that would preach that and teach that and tell you that. That's not 
what it says. Verse number 8. Let's read it again. He that, it doesn't say he that, aren't you glad that you say, I don't know that a, a one or two letters make a difference. I can tell you that ETH makes a difference between an ETH and an S. Amen. If it said he that commits sin is of the devil, we'd be in trouble. Amen. I hope your Bible says he that committeth. That's the correct translation. He that continually, habitually lives in sin, and what's it say? Is of the devil. Not that he was saved and lost it. He was never saved. They were never saved. And if you live a lifestyle of continual, habitual sin, then you have never been saved. You've been deceived. Verse number eight, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Sin, uh, sinneth. What's the, devil, what's the devil done from the beginning? Sinneth, continually, habitually sins. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Aren't you glad? Listen, when God saves you, you know, we talk about this a lot. Salvation, there's three aspects to salvation. Number one, you get saved immediately. You get saved from the penalty of sin. Yeah. Once you get saved, Jesus died on the cross. His blood paid the debt of sin that you could not pay. You don't ever have to worry about being charged for that sin again. They're not going to, God's not going to hold you accountable for that because the blood of Jesus has paid your penalty. Man, that ought to make a dry Baptist shot. Amen. We'll just take time out and just chew, chew and go out. Let the neighborhood just go out one door and in the other. Amen. People say, what's going on over there? They say, we're saved. Amen. That's why Romans chapter 8, verse number 1 that we talked about a couple weeks ago. There is therefore now no what? Condemnation. Amen. Listen, you're not guilty in the eyes of God. The penalty that you were living under has been washed away by the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad? Aren't, I, I can tell you something. <clears throat> and I've been preaching 45 years. But I'm glad that when God looks at me, He doesn't look at Mike, the preacher. Because, man, Mike, the preacher, still got some issues that he's got to work on. He's still working on me. But when He sees me now, He sees us. He sees us. He sees you through the blood of Jesus. Amen. And when He looks at you through the blood of Jesus, and you're covered and your sins are not imputed to uh, imputation they're not imputed to you they're not counted against you Amen. because they've been paid for by the Lord Jesus Amen. isn't that about the most precious thing Amen. that you could ever hear Why? Wow. and then there's the then there's salvation that you know that's called when you've been saved from the penalty of sin that's called justification justification means just as if I've never sinned can you imagine that? When God looks at you now, He looks at you in a justified state like you have never sinned. Man, listen, my life has been a mess. My, I've had so many sins piled up in my life, but yet when God looks at me because I've been saved, He sees me justified. And then not only have I been saved from the penalty of sin, I'm being saved from the Power of sin. Amen. That's called sanctification. I'm being, as you, if, listen, you ought to be a better Christian today than you were a year ago. Because that's called growth, growing. As you grow, as you study, as you learn the Word of God, as you come to church, as you read, as you pray, as you get close to God, you ought to automatically get, become a better Christian. And as you get, man, I don't know how to say that. What I know, I, I, I do know how to say it. And, and I know you might think it's a lie, but it's the truth. When you've been saved as long as I have, you don't even enjoy sin. You don't even, you can't even enjoy it. You know it's wrong. You know you shouldn't do it. You get tempted. You give in to something. You say, oh man, oh man. It's, it's like eating a big meal when you're trying to diet. I know a lot about that. You know, you eat a big meal, and boy, this is going to be great, and you eat it, and about five minutes later, I, I, if Kathy had a dollar for every time, I said, boy, I wish I hadn't eaten that. 
Because it, I thought I wanted it. I thought it would satisfy my taste. I thought it was exactly what I wanted. Knowing I didn't need it. Knowing my body didn't need it. Knowing my diabetes didn't need it. But I ate it anyhow. And then five minutes later, I'm going, oh, gosh. You know, it, no wonder people puke it up. I've never been into that. And I don't, I don't advertise that or advocate that. But yeah, I, I've wanted to a few times. And it's the same way with sin. When you've been saved, yeah, you've still got the potential, you've got the propensity to sin, but what they when you do, man, it, it, there's just something about it. It's just not like it used to be. Man, it's not like it used to be. You just, I can remember when, as a young boy, when, when at, at, you know, at, at 18, 19 years old, when I finally got my life right with the Lord, after years of up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, finally got right with the Lord. And I'd been doing, I'd lived, I, I had, and I don't want to go into that, but I had done so many evil, wicked things during that lifespan. That we used to have drive-ins. You know what drive-ins are? Y'all have drive-ins? Drive, drive, you, know, you grow, just pull up on the curb. You know, you pull up on the curb, you get get your beer, get your whatever you want. I'd go by there and I'd smell those places. And go, oh, So I said, son, I've been boycotting Bush and those guys for years. Man, I don't know. Thank God for the redneck boys that's finally got on board and boycotting them. But, man, I've been boycotting them for years. Because you've been, that's the power. God gives you the power to overcome sin. He gives you, the Bible says that when we've been tempted, we all get tempted. But God, who is faithful, Makes a way so you can escape. If you, if you will. Sometimes we give in to it. Apparently you've given in to it. You raised your hand up and said, well, I've sinned since I got saved. That's because we give in to it. But the longer that we're saved, I don't even, I don't even, but other way to say it, you ought to be better. Right. Somebody's been saved and been in the church 40 or 50 years. Wow. And they still living like they did when they were... There's something wrong with that. Right. Something wrong with that. And then not only you got been saved from the penalty of sin, that's past. That's, that's a done deal. You will never, ever be judged for your sin. Boy, I don't make a shout. I'm telling you. Amen. Wow, the things I've done, and probably the things you've done, if we knew about it, we could probably fill this room up, but we'd be going, oh, my goodness. Thank God those things are covered by the blood and they're, and they're gone. Amen. You don't have to worry about God pulling you up and say, Hey, you remember what you did back there 45 years ago? Man, I don't want to hear that. Do you? <laughs> Devil does enough of that. Man, I don't hear that. But then we've been, just, we've been justified. And then we get saved from the power of sin. That's called sanctification. Sanctification goes up and down. As you grow and go with the Lord, you give in to temptation, it's kindly fluid. And then the third part of salvation, being saved, is you're saved from the presence of sin. That'll be when you die or when the rapture happens, when we get to heaven. Amen. That's called glorification. Once you get in your glorified state, sin will not be there. <laughs> Satan will not be there. Satan will not be able to inhabit he heaven. He will not be with us on that side. Thank God. Amen. Never an unkind word. Never a cuss word. Never all this foolishness that we're seeing going on today. It'll never be there. We'll be saved from the presence of sin. Amen. I don't know about you, but I haven't been saved from the presence of sin yet. All we got to do, we really don't have to walk. We can sit right here and get in enough. But you walk out that door and get in the world, you're out there in a, in a, in a wicked world. Right. But one day we're going to be saved from that. So that's salvation in three tenses. You've been saved from the penalty of sin. You're being saved from the power of sin. And one day you will be saved from the presence of sin. Man, that's, that's good stuff right there. Amen. I mean, that's, that's just good stuff. Where are we in the Bible? Just read, let me go back and read 8 and we'll get 9 and we'll be ready to get out of here. Verse number 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil. That's not, again, that's not commits a sin. That's committeth a continual habitual sins is of the devil. For the, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. 
For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now listen to verse number 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. Whose seed? God's seed. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. You know when you got saved, before you got saved, you were you had a you had a, a sinful nature. Right? That's right? Made it easier to sin than it did to do right. When you got saved, you got to see to God. The new nature of God is placed down in you. That part of you cannot sin. Amen. The part that sins is that old flesh. You got the flesh suit still hanging up in the closet. Don't throw it away because, hey, listen, it'll get back on you. You say, man, I, I hear people say, man, I, man, I haven't been upset. I haven't been angry. I haven't sinned and all the, oh, listen, it'll, and it'll still fit you. It'll get on you because you've still got that old sin nature hanging on you, carrying on you. And that's what sins is that old sinful nature that the part of God that's in you, the Holy Ghost of God, look, he's perfect. He's sinless. He can't sin. God can't sin. Jesus can't sin. The Holy Ghost of God can't sin. And if you've got that seed in you, He can't sin in you. It's the sin of your sinful nature. Remember what Paul says, not, it's, it's, not, it's my flesh that does it. We've got a fleshly nature that we're going to drag over. And some people teach the ratification of that sinful nature when you get saved. God help those people. I bet you I could, I bet you I could, you know, I can aggravate people pretty good. I bet you I could aggravate them to sin. They say, I've lost my, I've lost my ability to sin. I ain't never met anybody that's lost their ability to sin. Now you might meet somebody that says, I've lost my ability to sin, but they've lied. Or they don't know what sin is. <laughs> yeah, they're sinning and don't even know it. Because man, I'm going to tell you what, man, listen, the, this old flesh, when did I say, when are you going to get rid of this flesh and get in the, where there's no more presence of sin? When you die or Jesus comes. Amen. Until then, you're going to be in the flesh. You're going to have this sin nature that you're carrying around. That's why Paul said, man, the creation groans and travails, even the pain right now, waiting for the redemption. I'm going to get on a sidetrack right here and hurt some people's feelings, but I might as well do it. We've got these people that say we got redeemed and we got totally redeemed when we got saved. We didn't get totally redeemed. The only thing that got redeemed about you was your soul. Your spiritual man is what got redeemed. If you don't believe that, and I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to get a point. You go home and look in the mirror. Your body hadn't been redeemed yet. If it did, if it did, if it did, there's a bad, if it did, there's a bad problem. Amen. My body's getting worse as it gets older. Amen. You know why it's getting worse as it gets older? Because this body has not been redeemed yet. Right. Jesus died on the cross to pay for the penalty of sin Amen. and redeem your soul and save your soul from hell. Amen. He's coming back. To redeem this body. Woo, that puts a shout on me that he's coming back to redeem this body. And when he comes back, that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This old flesh, this robe of flesh, I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize, and I'll get a body made like unto him. My body hadn't been redeemed. I'm supposed to be wearing hearing aids. I don't because I'm stubborn. I'm supposed to be wearing glasses. I don't. I wear contacts because I can't see. Everything about me is wearing out. It's wearing out. It's wor You just said a minute ago, you're going to quit working on all this stuff because your body is wearing out. That's the natural process of life, that it wears out. It wears down. 
and you can't do in my mind. You know, my, 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 when my daddy was getting old, I never understood this as a kid, as a young, young guy. My daddy, my daddy died at 87. He still thought in his mind he was a, a young man. But he couldn't do, the body wouldn't do what the mind wanted to do. Right. And as I've gotten older, I think, boy, there's things I want to do, and I try to do them. I go, man, oh man I can't even do that anymore. Wait till I get older. If I live, it's going to get worse. Yeah. So, you know, but we've got these people that take the verse out of Isaiah 53, that by his stripes you're healed, and claim that, that every time you have an ailment or something that's wrong in the physical body, the blood of Jesus is taking care of that. That's not true. I, I wish it was true. You go over into Peter. Peter verified that out. Peter talked about that same verse in Isaiah. Talked about his salvation. The blood of Jesus did heal you. He did heal you. By his stripes you were healed. You were saved from an eternity in hell. And one day he's going to. One day he's going. He's going to heal that body. Amen. He's going to heal that body. But until. I see it all over Facebook. People going you know, Isaiah 53, by his stripes are here, by his stripes. By, that's a, that's, that is one of the most misused verses in the Bible. If you don't believe it, how many times have you claimed it and it, it ain't happened? I had somebody, had somebody, I taught on that a couple years ago. Somebody, somebody wanted to call my hand. I said, you said you, you don't believe in healing. You don't believe the blood of Jesus. Yeah, I said, what well, doesn't? I said, God can heal you if he wants to. You, amen? amen? God can reach down and heal you. He can do whatever he wants to. Right. But you can't, everybody got saved can't claim physical healing under the atonement of Jesus Christ. Right. If, if it is, there's something wrong. Because I've been, listen, my mother died with cancer. My sister died with cancer. My father-in-law died with cancer. My mother-in-law died with a heart attack. None of those were, their bodies were just brought back to normal. People die. That's right. By his stripe, you've been healed. You've been healed. Right now, you've been healed spiritually. Amen. Hallelujah. And hey, hang on, baby. There's a better day coming. Amen. With a better day coming. Never going to tell the story. I'll try to get a Poor Cletus. What was Cletus' last name? Cletus worked with Kathy back years ago, back in, in Logan, West Virginia. I can't remember Cletus. If anybody's on can remember Cletus, I can't remember his name. If Rosetta's on, she might remember. Cletus was dying. Looked like Hoss Cartwright, didn't he? Big, old, big, big. I think he might have had one tooth in his head, maybe. <laughs> old Cletus got saved. Man, old Cletus got saved. Hallelujah. He got cancer. They called me one night to come to the hospital. I think his fever was like 104 or something like that, seemed like. I mean, he was just like, just moments, moments away from dying and leaving this world. And I got down over top, I talked to Cletus. Oh, Cletus opened up, he grinned right big. I think he might have had one tooth, maybe didn't have a tooth. He grinned right big and he said, hey, Mike. He said, and I'm going to be running through heaven here just in a little bit. Amen. He knew that that body was going to get it. Unfortunately, you got to go through a death process to get it, right. or the rapture to get it. Amen. But it'll be worth it, amen? Amen. Well, I hope, I hope that you got something out of that. And I hope that you understand that passage of Scripture. Amen. I hope that you understand that you can't, well, you can say you're saved and continue to live like the devil, but I don't think you're saved. I think the Bible bears it out. And I don't think you're saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. Because when you get saved, your sins have been forgiven. Remember, there's a difference between sonship and fellowship. I can't lose my sonship. Like I said, I, I, I always thought I don't want to be like my daddy. I don't want to be like my daddy. The older I get, I'm just like him. I, because, because I'm a part of him. I've got his. I've got his chromosomes and genes that transferred right into me. I can't get away from that. Kathy's worried about that. <laughs> you know, all she said begs, "Don't be, don't be stubborn like your daddy." Well, I'm already stubborn. So I mean, God help us. You know, think about how it's going to get over the next few years. But you know, hey, listen. 
Man, I'm glad. I, listen, when you understand, I guess that's the reason I've taken so much time on salvation. When you understand salvation, it's the greatest thing in the world. Amen. And I don't want you to go home and, and, and go to bed at night and worry that you've never been saved. Or, oh, oh, man, I, I, somebody cut me off in traffic and something came out of my mouth and it shouldn't. I think I'm lost. You're not lost. You're not lost. You're not lost. God's covered those sins. Amen. He's forgiven you of all your sins, past, present, and future. Amen. And when you, let me say this. Let me say this. Salva, people say, well, salvation is a very basic thing. When you can understand salvation, you're well on your way to being what God wants you to be. Amen. Because you can live and be free and enjoy life. and not, I don't go to bed at night worrying about I'm going to wake up in hell. I don't worry about my salvation rolling out of my ear out on the pillow and, and losing it through the night. I don't worry about the bomb. I don't have to worry about that because I, I know, I know, I know that there's a better day coming. Amen. Amen. And I won't have to. I won't have to worry about hobbling around. I won't have to worry about my back hurting. I cut all the grass you want on the other side. I, you know, weed eat if you want to, man. I'm telling you, I won't have to worry about any of that stuff. Won't it be great? Amen. Listen, and, and listen, we could get into this and go another hour or two. You go, listen, I'll know you in heaven and you'll know me in heaven. Paul said we'll be known as we're known. We are just, all the, all the ugly, the sinfulness, the fleshly part will be gone, but we'll still be Mike and you'll still be Bill and Ed and you'll still be who you are. You're not going to lose that in eternity. People ask so many times, well, well, I know my loved ones in heaven. And you know what I always say? If I know you here with a little bit of mind that I've got, surely when I become perfect over on that side, I'll know you on that side. I'm not going to lose the ability to know. I'm not going to lose the ability. I'm not going to lose the relationships we've had. No, everything's going to be far better in heaven. Amen. It's going to be great. Just make sure you're saved and on your way to heaven. Amen. Amen. Marie Hugh put it on there, pain free. You're right, Miss Marie. Big John Huey's mom, man. Pain free. Can you? Won't be great to be pain free. Amen. My wife has lived in pain, constant pain for years. I don't know how she does it. Years and years and years. Some of you probably got. You maybe you've got constant pain. Man, listen, I don't like pain. Won't it be great to be pain-free? Yes. Imagine to wake up in heaven and all of a sudden go, wow. Wow. Wow, man, that doesn't hurt because it'll be great. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being on today. We love you. Have a great day.